Good afternoon. This meeting of the Richmond Rent Board is now in session. The time is 5.01 p.m. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining the October 19th, 2022 regular meeting of the Richmond Rent Board. Before we begin, I would like to go over a few reminders to the public regarding public comments. Members of the public were asked to submit requests to speak on any item on the agenda including their name, phone number, and item for which, for which they wish to speak, uh, make public comment on, to Cynthia underscore Shaw at ci.richmond.ca.us by 3 p.m. today as described on the first page of the agenda. If you wish to make a, a comment on any item on the agenda and have not emailed me your request, you must do so in accordance with the first page of the agenda before the item is called. Requests received via email during the meeting and after the deadline to submit comments will be accommodated as reasonably possible and will be limited to a maximum of one to two minutes, depending on the number of commenters, as more fully, fully described in the rent board meeting agenda procedures. This meeting is being conducted as a Zoom webinar. Members of the public are considered attendees and will be muted for the duration of the meeting unless called upon during public comment and unmuted by the webinar host. The city cannot guarantee that its network and or the site will be uninterrupted. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and all statements made during this webinar will be on the public record. The first item on the agenda is pledge to the flag. Please join me in pledge to the flag. I pledge of allegiance. allegiance. Flag, flag of, the United, of the United States of America, public for which it stands, America. one nation, nation under God, under God liberty, and justice, liberty and justice for all. The next item on the agenda is the roll call. For the purpose of the recording, may I please get an audible <clears throat> roll call from rent board meet members and staff? Board mm -hmm. Member Connor? Present. Board Member Johnson? Present. Board member Vasilas. Present. Vice Chair Mushek. Present. Chair Finley. Here. Executive Director Nicholas Trailer. Here. Deputy Director Fred Tran. Present. And Charles, General Counsel Charles Ochenuga. Here. For the record, Staff Attorney Palomar Sanchez is absent. The next item on the agenda is statement of conflict of interest. Are there any? Hearing none, the next item on the agenda is agenda review. Are there any changes to the agenda? Any changes to the agenda from the staff? No, no changes. Any changes to the agenda from board members? Okay, hearing Thank none. Thank you. Hearing none, the next item on the agenda is item E under public forum. Tonight, we have three speakers. Each speaker shall be allowed up to two minutes to address the board. When your name is called, please wait until the webinar host lets you know that you have been unmuted. For the record, please state your name and your residence is optional. Please terminate your address to the board when your time expires. We ask that you keep your comments respectful and appropriate. You will be muted when your time expires. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen. Second. Okay, the first, the first, um, the first speaker is Mitch Rice. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. You go ahead. Uh, thanks for letting me speak today. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of one of my real estate clients who owns property in Richmond. Um, he's been a landlord there since 2016. And when the pandemic hit, he was kind enough to lower the rent for his tenants to accommodate their um, their needs and their economic hardships. And 
you know, he's losing his job in a couple weeks and he would like to sell his property so he can have some financial stability in his life. And we're just hoping that you guys can do everything you can to lift the emergency mandate. You know, the president has ended the said the pandemic was over and Gavin Newsom is lifting the statewide uh, urgency addendum in February. So um, please just do whatever you can to help out the landlords. I know the tenants are just as important, if not more important. Um, but yeah, thank you for your time and consideration. Appreciate it. Thank you. The next speaker is Cordell Handler. Can you hear me, Cynthia? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Yes. So, good evening, uh, Chair Finley, uh, board members. Um, I am Cordell Handler, and I'm a Richmond resident. So, I'd like to talk to you about uh, F6 on the consent calendar. Let me repeat it again, because. For the, for the, let me reiterate my comments from last month. So I have looked at other cities, you know, in West County, and they have done hybrid meetings. So it has been very successful. So I'm thinking that I think it's time that the rent board as well can come back into the chambers at some point because, because I mean, I feel that it's time that the public wants to see the board in its, in its format. So and I agree with uh, Ms. Clark, having hybrid meetings is very, has been very successful. So I was just in a meeting uh, earlier and I uh, was talking about like, you know, go for the city of Berkeley to go back to in-person. So if other cities can do hybrid meetings, I think Richmond can do the same thing. So that's for F6, but, but I do have a fun announcement to share with you all. So you are cordially invited to attend the, the Richmond Rotary Club weekly meeting October the 28th at the Richmond Country Club. Tickets are only $25 a person. And um, our speaker for that meeting will be Ben Trail, who will be talking to us about Spark Point of Contra Costa County. Their office is all, is all throughout Richmond in McDonald Avenue. So hopefully you, the rent board can come and I will yield my time to the next person. I have some comments for a G. To Cordell, you faded out. What did you say? You have comments for G2? No, G3. G3? Okay. Um, okay. I'll add you to, I'll add you to the list. For that. I'll add you to the list for that. Okay. Okay. All right. The next speaker is Zach. Jensen. Hello, Rent Board. My name is Zach Jensen. Uh, I'm a resident of Richmond and a small uh, landlord in District 6. Thank you for listening to me tonight. I just want to say I appreciate the rent program and um, all the work that it's been done to educate landlords and protect tenants. And um, I'm a rent control advocate. Uh, even though I'm a landlord. Um, I just wanted to call and say, um, I know it's up to the voters at this point, but I just wanted to give you a snapshot of the impact of the potential provision in the upcoming proposition that caps <clears throat> rent at 60% of the CPI. Um, I'm, I get the need and the desire to protect renters and put a cap and a 3% cap makes a lot of sense to me, especially considering historically, um, the rent increase has been right about 3%. Um, that still puts a brunt on the landlords from inflation if it's higher than that, but it does protect the renters. But I think that overall in all years going forward, uh, inflation aside, putting um, a 60% cap on the CPI is, um, I'm really worried just for myself, I operate right about even or at a loss sometimes if I have a lot of maintenance but also just for the city in general and long-term property values, just because when it comes to equity, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> multi-unit buildings are not uh, valued. They're not, the value isn't calculated the same way as uh, single family homes. Single family homes get whatever the market will bear. 
and um, the other multifamily is, you know, a rent minus expenses divided by the, um, the cap. So I think it's kind of a double hit because it's sort of hitting um, people as far as monthly expenses, but then also the property value as well. And I'm really concerned that this is going to lead to people buying who only have large cash reserves or corporate buyers or rich people, uh, unlike myself. Thank you. That was the last speaker. The next item on the agenda is to approve the consent calendar. I move that Does we- Does anyone wish to remove anything from the consent calendar? <clears throat> Staff, do you have any removals? No, okay. Board members, anyone wish to remove anything? Okay, please continue. Uh, may I have a motion? Sorry, I keep jumping in and it's not my turn. I move that we approve the consent calendar. Okay. Thank you, may we have a second? I'll second. That's board member Johnson. Did we have a vote? Yes, board member Connor? Yes. <clears throat> board member Johnson? Yes. Board member Vasilas? Yes. Vice Chair Mishek? Yes. And Chair Finley? Yes. Motion passes to, to approve the consent calendar unanimous. The next item on the agenda is item G1. Item G1 is to receive and approve the 2019 through 2020, 2020 through 2021 rent program annual report infographic video and direct staff to present present to the to present the report to the city council. There are no speakers on this item. Thank you. May we have the report, please? Yes, Nicholas will be presenting. Please. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, I need to share my screen. Hopefully, I'm going to just do a quick sound check to because uh, you know Zoom can be a challenge sometimes. So one second. Okay, I'm assuming you can see this. Yes. Okay, I'm just going to play for a second. Tell me if you can hear it. Richmond Rent Program. Yes. Please contact. Okay. So before we get started, um, I just want to uh, dispel a couple of things. Uh, last time we did an infographic video yeah. annual report, um, there were certain folks uh, who, uh, you know, made kind of some false statements about uh, the cost of doing this uh, re this infographic video. Uh, I think at the time they, they, they made up a number and said, I, we spent $5,000 or something like that. Uh, to be clear, um, this uh, infographic video was produced by myself. Um, it is something that I've, I, a little skill that I've picked up over the years. Uh, and the actual cost of it is uh, an annual sub subscription to uh, an infographic video making service, and it's around $800 a year. So with that said, uh, I hope you enjoy this annual report. This is two fiscal years, 2019-20 and 2020-21. And so obviously, uh, it includes uh, one year prior to the pandemic and one year in the pandemic. So you might find it interesting. All right, here we go. Nicholas, can you turn up the volume a little bit? Because um, Vice Chair said it's a little low. So just turn up the volume a little bit. Yeah, when you get ready to play. Okay, okay. I, very good. I'll start over. If you can't hear it, um, you might want to also uh, put your volume as, as high as you can. Hopefully that works. All right, here we go. And how do I get it to full screen? There we go. The mission of the rent program is to promote neighborhood and community stability, healthy housing, and affordability for Richmond tenants through the regulating of those landlord-tenant matters that reasonably relate to rents and evictions 
while maintaining a landlord's right to a fair return. There are two pillars of the rent ordinance, rent stabilization and eviction protections. Working in tandem, these two components create housing stability, which in turn builds increased affordability, healthier housing, and community stability. Studies have shown that housing stability produces innumerable benefits for the community. First, housing stability contributes to financial stability. Financial stability allows both tenants and landlords to plan for the future and to invest in their properties and community. Second, housing stability contributes to healthier housing. When knowing that they are protected from evictions and arbitrary or excessive rent increases, tenants are more likely to assert their right to habitable housing, resulting in a healthier and more attractive housing stock. Third, housing stability contributes to a decrease in homelessness and overcrowding by preventing unwarranted and arbitrary evictions, and by diminishing the need to bring in extra housemates to pay excessive rent increases. Fourth, housing stability leads to better academic performance. Displacement during an academic year is a major factor in poor grades and low attendance. When children reside in a stable housing environment, it becomes reflective in positive school performance. Finally, housing stability contributes to reduced psychological and physiological stress and improved mental health. Demonstrating the real connection between stable housing and positive health outcomes. The difficulties of the COVID-19 pandemic further emphasize the interconnectedness of all of our health outcomes. And that housing stability is a public health issue. To protect public health, save lives, and maintain strong housing stability through the pandemic, local, county, and state governments adopted eviction and rent increase moratoria. Rent program staff accepted the charge of not only continuing to enforce the rent ordinance, but also of being the hub of pandemic-related information for Richmond landlords and tenants. Rent program staff became the local experts for landlords and tenants regarding the slew of new and often intersecting city, county, and state eviction and rent increase moratoria, and a critical force in connecting rent assistance to those in need. To assist landlords facing pandemic-related financial hardship, the rent program adopted a policy of allowing landlords to either request a deferral or to set up a payment plan to manage their rental housing fees. Finally, in response to the pandemic, the rent program spearheaded the development of Richmond's first rent assistance program, dedicated solely to Richmond landlords and tenants. To work toward the mission of building housing and community stability, the rent program employs active enforcement of the rent ordinance. Active enforcement has three components. First, to reach high levels of compliance, the rent program must have good data on rental properties, tenancies, and lawful rent levels. Collecting good data is achieved through the property enrollment and tenancy registration process. Second, Active enforcement is achieved through counseling, community education, and mediation. Finally, active enforcement means providing landlords and tenants with recourse through the rent adjustment petition process. Rent program staff have worked diligently, steadily increasing compliance every year from 61% in 2017 to 78% in 2018 to 93% in 2019, and finally to 96% in 2020. To achieve high levels of compliance, our staff has been both responsive and proactive. They respond to issues and questions brought forth from the community and through community workshops, outreach, and research, working to ensure that landlords are aware of their property enrollment, tenancy registration, and rental housing fee responsibilities. Towards that end, our staff has held 2,494 billing and enrollment consultations, sent out 1,111 property enrollment packets, and enrolled 673 properties. 
Having more accurate data on rental properties and tenancies enhances our ability to perform community outreach, education, and counseling. For the rent ordinance to be enforced, Richmond landlords and tenants must know their rights and responsibilities. Public information staff devote their time and resources to educating the public about their rights derived from the rent ordinance. This knowledge empowers the community to assert its rights under the law. Public information staff held 9,670 counseling sessions with landlords and tenants on issues ranging from how to take lawful rent increases, the requirements around having just cause to evict, security deposit disputes, how to file rent increase or rent decrease petition, how to apply for emergency rental assistance, what the new rules and limitations are around lawfully performing evictions during the pandemic, and options for resolving habitability problems. Rent program staff also mediated 20 formal landlord-tenant disputes and many more informal disputes. The rent program contracts with the Eviction Defense Center and Bay Area Legal Aid to refer community members to legal assistance and representation necessary to assert their rights. 218 households in Richmond received legal service referrals from the rent program. Getting landlords and tenants on the same page about how rent control and eviction protections work is one of the most effective ways to enforce the rent ordinance. Towards that end, rent program staff held 20 webinars and workshops with 574 community members in attendance. Another key way the rent ordinance is enforced is with landlord-tenant outreach associated with the noticing requirements for rent increase and eviction notices. The rent ordinance requires landlords to submit a copy to the rent program of any rent increase notice served on a tenant within 10 business days of having served that notice. The rent increase notices are then reviewed by staff and any unauthorized rent increase is flagged resulting in a courtesy compliance letter being sent to both the landlord and the tenant. The rent ordinance also requires landlords to submit to the rent program a copy of any notice of termination of tenancy within two business days of having served the tenant. Staff review notices of termination of tenancy and those prohibited by law result in a courtesy compliance letter being sent to both the landlord and the tenant. During the pandemic, this was especially important because emergency laws required additional steps and requirements to terminate a tenancy. Over the past two fiscal years, the rent program has sent over 800 courtesy compliance letters to landlords and tenants. The rent program actively enforces the rent ordinance by recording and tracking maximum allowable rents through tenancy registration. By tracking the maximum allowable rent for rent control tenancies, both landlords and tenants can keep track of each year's rent ceiling to avoid rent overcharges. By avoiding rent overcharges, landlords and tenants also steer clear of future disputes over their rent and prevent unnecessary rent board petitions. The final component of active enforcement of the rent ordinance is the rent adjustment petition process. Not only does rent control stabilize rents, but it also offers a petition process for adjusting rents. For example, tenants may petition for lower rent to encourage and compel landlords to address habitability issues. On the other hand, landlords may petition for increased rent due to capital improvements or to maintain the net operating income they achieved before rent control came into effect. In the last two fiscal years, there were 937 consultations with the hearings unit coordinator, seven individual rent increases ordered, 13 individual rent decreases ordered, and 41 settlement agreements reached. Now let's look at rental housing in Richmond by the numbers. First, let's address an important question. 
Since the number of rental units reported by the rent program has decreased from 24,797 to 19,714, has Richmond seen a decline in rental units? The short answer is no. The number of rental units reported by the RIM program initially included thousands of suspected rental units. Through annual exemption verification and billing projects, over 5,000 suspected rental units were removed from the rental housing database. The result indicates not a decline in available rental units, but better reported data. Of the 19,714 recorded rental units in Richmond, 43% are fully covered, meaning they have both rent controls and just cause eviction protections, and 57% are partially covered, meaning only just cause eviction protections apply. Breaking down the number of partially covered rental units in Richmond, we see that 20.7% are governmentally subsidized rental units, and the remaining 36.3% are single-family homes, condominiums, and post-February 1, 1995 construction. Breaking down the number of governmentally subsidized units, we see that there are 2,925 low-income housing tax credit units, there are 1,215 housing choice vouchers, and 789 units that are HUD project-based. There are 26 affordable housing developments in Richmond. In accordance with Rent Board Regulation 202, affordable housing is exempt from rent control, but subject to just cause eviction protections and associated relocation payment requirements. To maintain the exemption from rent control, affordable housing providers must be in compliance with Resolution 19-01 which limits annual rent increases to no more than 5%. Tenants and landlords of affordable housing can seek assistance from the rent program with eviction-related issues and request mediation to resolve conflicts. Let's now look at rent increase data. The authorized annual rent increase or the annual general adjustment was 3.5% in 2019 and 2.9% 2 in 2020. However, during the pandemic, there was a significant drop in rent increase notices being filed with the rent program due to the City of Richmond and Contra Costa County's rent increase moratoria. In fiscal year 2019-2020, there were 939 rent increase notices filed with the rent program. The median rent for a rent-controlled unit was $1,550. The median rent increase was $50. In fiscal year 2020-2021, there were 233 rent increase notices filed with the rent program. The median rent for rent-controlled units was $1,400 and the median rent increase was $39. Now let's look at a short analysis of termination of tenancy notices filed with the rent program. Fiscal year 2019-2020, there were 1,925 notices of termination of tenancy filed with the rent program. In fiscal year 2020-2021, there were 541 termination of tenancy notices filed with the rent program. This 72% decrease in notices of termination of tenancy filed was clearly connected to the COVID-19 Tenant Relief Act, which prohibited most evictions for non-payment of rent claim due to financial hardship caused by the COVID-19 pandemic, with the caveat that the tenant pay 25% of the rent. We conclude this annual report with a brief summary of the rent program's finances. In fiscal year 2019-2020, with a total budget of $2.9 million, the rent program finished the year with a modest reserve collecting 93% of the rental housing fees. In fiscal year 2020-2021, the rent program also ended the year with a modest reserve reaching 96% compliance in the collection of the rental housing fee.
To learn more about services provided by the Richmond Rent Program, please contact us at 510-234-RENT. That's 510-234-7368. Or visit us at 440 Civic Center Plaza, 2nd Floor, Richmond, California. As well as online at richmondrent.org. Okay. Thank you. Let me stop sharing. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, obviously, two years of activity is a lot, so it was a 15-minute video, uh, longer than I normally would expect. But I'm happy to answer any questions um, that you may have about the annual report. We will be um, presenting this uh, video <clears throat> and answering questions in front of the city council on the 25th uh, next Tuesday. So thank you. Chair Finley, Board Member Johnson has her hand up. Thank you. Ms. Johnson. So yeah, that was a great video, but I just was wondering about uh, tenants in shared housing, you know, the, the houses where they have rooms for rent. I didn't see information about them. Those types of properties are fully covered by the rent ordinance uh, in most cases, unless the landlord shares a kitchen and or bath with the tenants in, in the house. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so they are, uh, they are rent controlled. Uh, so they are included in the count uh, and percentage of, of fully controlled rental units. And we have several hundred of those in Richmond, several hundred units uh, that are SROs or single occupancy um, units or rooming houses. Chair Finley, board member Vasilis has his hand up. Mr. Vasilis. Yeah, um, I caught the, um, in the median rent portion uh, is is am I correct when when it said that the um, it was fourteen hundred dollars is the median rent now? It went down uh, the year um, you know during the pandemic uh, went down significantly. Uh, it, this year uh, our, we're we're going to be presenting soon on the new numbers, uh, but I don't have those ready. Uh, but yes, they did go down during the pandemic. Um, uh, you know, as, as did. Uh, a lot of things. So it's safe to say that right now it's the fourteen hundred, though, or close to that. Prior, to uh, I'm assuming that it. I, I'm assuming, and, it, and when I say assuming, I mean I don't know for sure. But because of inflation, um, uh, I'm assuming that there's going to be an increase um, in the uh, median rent. Okay. Any other questions from staff? Or excuse me, from board members? All right. Uh, do we have speakers on this item? So Chair Finley, we did not have any requests to speak on this item, but while the item was in the, you know, while the presentation was going forward, um, we did get a request to speak. And I'll leave that decision up to you. And so what just it was after the item was called and during the presentation, I received a request to speak on this item. So I'll, I'll have to leave it up to you to uh, approve it or not. Yeah, that's all right with me. Let's go ahead. Let's hear the speaker. Okay, so the speaker is Alana Clark. So I'm gonna share my screen with the timer. <clears throat> Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to say that the um, five thousand dollar estimate of the cost of last year's video actually came from the amount of the compensation package that Nick Trailer collects divided by fifty two, because he said himself that it took him a week to put together. So it was not a lie. It was actually a figure based on information that has been given to us by the rent board. That's all I have. Thank you very much. That was the all last, right. the only speaker. 
Thank you. Um, do we have anything else from the board members that might wish to comment before we ask for a, uh, a motion? I don't see any, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Michette. Thank you. I just wanted to thank um, Director Nick Trailer for the presentation. I found it very informative. So thank you for that. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Would anyone care to make a motion? Hello. <laughs> Everyone's still here. <laughs> I end up making all the motions, so I'm giving I'm giving people a chance. Yeah, I was just gonna ask, did we have to give direction to present this? I, I wasn't under the impression we had to make a motion. That's why I was trying, well, we to, do trying to, to read. We do need to direct staff. Uh, Mr. Oshinuga, would you prefer a motion or would, do we just say, yes, we've received it and go ahead? Well, because the item's asking for a direct, for you to direct staff, I, the preference would be to direct staff. Through a motion. All right. Okay, I, I'm I sorry. Moved. I, I didn't quite. I, Mr. Oshinuga, did you say direct staff in a motion? Is that what you said? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Mishek. Thank you. I move to direct staff, or I, okay, I moved to direct staff to present this report to City Council. May we have a second, please? I'll second. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. May we have a vote, please? Board Member Connor? Yes. Board Member Johnson? Yes. Board Member Vasilas? No. Chair, Vice Chair Mishek? Yes. And Chair Finley? Yes. Motion passes with Board Member Vasilas voting no. Next item, please. Yes. The next item on the agenda is item G2. Item G2 is to receive proposed options for utilizing the $10,000 rent assistance partner grant and approve and authorize one of the three proposed options to spend the funds. We have one speaker on this item. Okay. Now, may we have the staff report, please? Yes, I'll be doing that uh, right now. Yeah. Um, yes. Are you going to share your screen, Nick? Or yeah, I, I am. Um, let me see here. Okay. Can you, uh, you might not be able to see that. If some, for some reason, it switched to another screen. Uh, oh, we see it. Uh, you we see, see it? Uh -huh. You see you the full screen? Yes, you just have to put it on presenter view. Oh, where is that? I think it's down there at the bottom. Right, Fred? Fred, you want to come over to my office real quick and uh, make sure I do this right? This, where is the... It's right, I think it's at the corner. It's right there at the bottom. That's the one I use. Yeah. Okay. Why is it? Uh, Are they able to see? The no, the, they only see the uh, the main. We see the whole thing. I'm looking at it. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah. Make it mm -hmm. bigger. What's that? Mine will switch over. I have a. Okay, I'll try to bring this over to here then. Can you see it now? No, we see your desktop. Hmm. Would it be easier if Fred shares it? Yeah, why don't you do that, Fred? We see uh, it now. Just go, yeah, you see it now? Yes. The whole thing? Yes, you just have to put it on presenter view. Okay, there we go. There you go. All right. May, may I ask a question? <laughs> Would it be possible to get rid of us in the frame so that we can have more room to see the actual presentation? Because we're 
we're missing part of it. Well, no, he she he just has to adjust it. If he goes to slideshow, he should be able to um, start it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure I do this. Okay, man. Or if do you want to unshare your screen, Nick, and then I'll yeah, yeah let's Let do that. Fred share it. All right, yeah, yeah. perfect. All right, mm -hmm. Fred, it's in the PowerPoint folder. So just close it, Nick, so he can get, he can use it. There you go. Is that, Fred, is that your screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Are you able to see the full screen right now? We we no. see it. You can make it bigger. Yeah, there you we go. go. Now we see it. Yeah. But you still need to remove us because we're still missing a, a, a six of the screen because our pictures are there. Well, he as he goes, he's showing one screen at a time. So you're going to see one screen at a time as he goes. Oh, okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, Chair Finley and members of the rent board, Nicholas Trailer. I'm going to be uh, presenting uh, the proposed options for utilizing the $10,000 rent relief partner grant that we received, and we'll get started. Uh, next slide. So uh, the, the Richmond Rent Program uh, has received um, $10,000 for participating in the creation and development of Richmond's Rent Assistance Program. At the um, August 17th, 2022 regular re meeting of the rent board, the rent board directed staff to return with uh, proposed options for utilizing the rent assistance partner grant. Uh, staff is proposing three options. Um, the first is mediation training for public information unit staff. Um, second is uh, mass mailing outreach campaign to inform Richmond landlords and tenants about rent program services, eviction protections, and rent assistance resources. And the third option is to um, just use the funds for general operating purposes or uh, have it go to the reserve. The next slide, please. <clears throat> so prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the rent programs director uh, organized a series of meetings with the city of Richmond, um, past rent board members, um, and city council members to discuss the creation of a rent assistance program dedicated to Richmond tenants and landlords. In the spring of 2020, the director and the deputy director of the rent program organized a meeting uh, with the city of Richmond's community development department to urgently address the anticipated increase in demand for rent assistance services in Richmond and began the process of developing a permanent rent assistance program. Local nonprofits uh, that are already engaged in providing rent assistance resources were invited uh, to meet with the rent program and city staff uh, to collaborate in the development of a permanent rent relief program. Next slide, please. The group uh, met weekly and has been meeting weekly uh, until recently. We've been meeting uh, weekly and now we're meeting bi weekly. Um, and this group called the Rent Relief Partnership or Rent Relief Committee um, has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, integrated itself into the Richmond Rapid Response Fund, and dispersed over uh, $385,000 in rent assistance to 77 Richmond renters and landlords. Um, on August uh, 3rd, 2022, the rent program received an email from Jessica Trevenia. Uh, the program coordinator for the Richmond Rapid Response Rent Relief Committee, informing the rent program that it had been awarded a $10,000 grant to support development of Richmond's rent assistance program. Next slide. <clears throat> now in fiscal year 2018-19, uh, the rent program enrolled three rent program services analysts, our housing counselors, uh, and the rent program's hearing examiner uh, in mediation training. 
Uh, we utilized uh, Steve Ro Rosenberg's mediation training program, uh, which is one of the most well-established and highly rated mediation programs in the Bay Area. One of the purposes of the rent ordinance uh, is to protect tenants against unwarranted and arbitrary evictions. And to enforce those eviction protections, rent program staff um, help resolve eviction disputes, uh, not only by educating landlords and tenants on their rights and recourse, um, but also by engaging in mediation. Now, the most common eviction related issue brought to the rent program are non payment of rent disputes. The, the COVID 19 pandemic um, has led to an increase in a significant increase in non payment of rent and rental de debt disputes. Uh, Non-payment of rent and rental debt disputes can often be resolved through mediation, uh, saving both the landlord and tenant from an unnecessary litigation and, um, and to help reduce displacement. Um, mediation that deals with non-payment of rent issues often require the negotiating of repayment plans. Um, just as a short example, um, I helped negotiate a, uh, a repayment plan um, uh, with a tenant uh, at Bella Vista who owed over $20,000 in rent. She had lost her job during the pandemic and um, uh, the, the management at uh, Bella Vista were very um, gracious to agree to mediation and they worked out a repayment plan um, um, in consideration of the fact that the tenant was reemployed and had uh, income coming in again. Um, Mediations um, generally also allow tenants and landlords to resolve other issues that are related to the tenancy and often related to the eviction dispute. Uh, these are nuisance situations, habitability issues or complaints, lease violations, among others. And the ability to conduct effective mediation around disputes that have uh, that often have uh, multiple intersecting concerns uh, requires strong understanding um, and expertise in mediation practices. Next slide, please. The rent program uh, to date has performed over 100 mediations on issues such as uh, breach of lease disputes, security deposit disputes, rent overcharges, habitability issues, non payment of rent and rental debt, uh, nuisance situations. Uh, relocation assistance and other issues. Um, as I think the board is very aware, we, we saw a significant uh, turnover in staff uh, during the pandemic. Um, we've had almost a complete turnover of our public information staff. Um, there is still, there's only one staff member with the rent program uh, that completed the 2019 uh, mediation training. And there are currently six rent program staff who may perform mediations and would benefit from mediation training. That, that those staff include two rent program services analysts that we just hired uh, that are actually still in training also. Uh, one supervising uh, analyst, uh, the program's deputy director uh, and the staff attorney that supports the public information uh, staff. Uh, as well as the rent program's hearing examiner. Now, the total cost to train six employees um, uh, is $9,750 per person, uh, excuse me, total, 9,750 total or 1,625 per staff. Um, staff recommend if the board chooses uh, or direct staff to use this option, um, Staff recommend using uh, Steve Rosenberg's mediation training program uh, based on the feedback that we've received from staff who uh, previously attended the, the training. Next slide, please. Option number two is uh, an, uh, engaging in an outreach campaign to promote rent assistance resources. Um, so another option is to spend the $10,000 grant um, on outreach and community education related to evictions and rent assistance resources. Um, if the board were to direct staff to utilize this option, staff would recommend utilizing a mass outreach approach and 
Um, one option would be um, a billboard ad in Richmond. I've been thinking about that for a while. I think it might be effective. Uh, we've uh, determined that $10,000 would pay for a billboard um, you know, at a major intersection in Richmond for uh, somewhere between three to six months, again, depending on location. Um, the billboard would inform Richmond residents about the rent program, eviction protections, and rent relief. Another option related to uh, uh, engaging in an outreach campaign would be um, a mass mailing. Uh, $10,000 uh, would pay for a, a mass mailing postcard that would reach all Richmond landlords and tenants. Um, the postcard would inform tenants and landlords about the rent program services, eviction protections, and rent relief resources. Next slide, please. And option number three is to use the $10,000 grant for general operating purposes or to set aside the money for reserves. Next slide, please. In terms of the proposed timeline, if the rent board directs staff to spend the $10,000 grant um, on option one, um, mediation training, or option two, a mass outreach project, rent program staff um, will present a project timeline and update the rent board of the project's progress during report of officers. Next slide, please. So the recommended action for tonight is to receive the proposed options for utilizing the $10,000 rent assistance partner grant and approve and authorize one of the three proposed options to spend the funds. And with that, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions and um, provide the board with my thoughts on these options. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the board members uh, for the presenter or other members of staff? Okay, so board member Connor's hand went up first and then um, board member Jonathan. Thank you, Ms. Connor. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, um, Director Trailer. I, I wanted to understand option one it how many staff members actually engage in mediations i was looking at the report and it looks like we did maybe three last month and 11 the month before do we need eight staff members to do mediations with those numbers that we're seeing monthly one of the things yeah thank you uh board member grace connor um one of the things uh, that we found is that it's important that we have backup in terms of uh, the ability to perform mediations. Um, and uh, part of the reason why is because at different times of the year, um, the bandwidth of the housing counselors is more limited uh, it's because they're um, you know, handling um, a larger um, load of uh, counseling cases. Um, so it's, it's helpful to have multiple staff who are able beyond our housing counselors um, to perform uh, mediations. And one of the reasons we wanna include our housing counselors is because they are the ones that often engage initially in informal mediation where they talk to both sides and they try to bring them together and then set up uh, at some point a formal mediation. Um, we also think that uh, our staff attorney uh, who um, uh, over, doesn't oversee, but assists um, the public information unit, essentially is the, you know, kind of call him uh, the attorney of the day, so to say. So he's the person that staff go to when there are questions um, that uh, require uh, his expertise. Um, so it's important that he also um, receives this training because he could potentially um, be a backup for the housing counselors if we have staff that are out or if their bandwidth is is too um, too full. Um, and then the hearing examiner um, of all of the staff, he's probably the one that um, uh, we could perhaps cut, or I would say if we wanted to cut the cost of uh, the the, the uh, spend a little less money on mediation training. Uh, we could remove him from the training because he has received the training before, but our hearing examiner engages in settlement conferences uh, every time there's a hearing. 
Um, so uh, making sure that he's up to date on his mediation skills, I think is important as well. Uh, and then of course, so, so we have three counselors, um, a staff attorney uh, who supports the public information unit, a uh, hearing examiner and uh, Fred Tran, our deputy director. Again, staff like Fred, um, you know, when we have uh, people who are out or on vacation or sick or, or if, if someone leaves, um, Fred has to fill in um, to assist in, uh, with uh, cases and some, some, you know, at, at times. So I think it's important that Fred also have uh, a mediation training. Well, let me say that I, maybe more than other members of the board, value the option for mediation just given my line of work. And I'm not diminishing the value of the training. My concern or my question was really around how many staff members do we need to have the training given what appears to be the number of mediations that are conducted in the office. So. Uh, that's one comment. My second comment is the recommended action doesn't require that we approve one. For example, I'm inclined to agree to, to some number of staff members receiving the training and would like to see the balance of that fund set aside for some other reason, you know, socked away for future use, given we already do quite a bit of outreach We've got 96% compliance according to the last beautifully done video presentation. Um, like it, it's not like the city of Richmond, our constituents don't know we're here. And so um, it, it, I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that it's not an either or proposition that we can craft something that allows us to do more than one of these things. Um, without being in, you know, violating some other funding rules from, from the, 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 the donor. Yeah, I, I believe that there is no, no issue with um, uh, breaking up the funds uh, for other, for different purposes. Um, there could be a combination of uh, mediation training for some staff and utilizing some of the the remainder of the money for outreach activities. Um, for $10,000, we could actually reach every resident in Richmond. Uh, so we actually would have some funds left uh, to reach all Richmond tenants and landlords would probably be closer to five or $6,000 uh, in, in you know, funds. Uh, so it is possible that we could do both um, if the board so, so directs. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, and I also want to just quickly mention that um, we do anticipate um, uh, with the all of the, the, the rest of the emergency orders going away, with the city of Richmond's urgency ordinance going away, uh, that we will see an increase in uh, eviction disputes. Um, so uh, just want to throw that in there as well even though right now we're, we're only doing a handful of mediations a month, um, I do believe that it, the, the number will increase because of the uh, expiration of the moratoria. Um, Ms. Johnson, did you have a comment or a question? So yeah, that's actually what I was gonna comment on is the possibility of splitting the 10,000 between Options one and two. <laughs> we certainly, as as I mentioned to Board Member Grice Connor, we certainly could do that. Okay, that was my question. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mishek. Are we just in the question asking stage, or are we in the issuing opinion stage too? Are you asking mm -hmm. me or the chair? Chair, anyone who can provide direction. Uh, I think you're in both. You can do whatever you wish. Okay. I, I want to advocate for um, option one. As board member Connor said, we have pretty high compliance. Um, of course, it's always good when people know what resources are available to them. But I think option one sounds like a good 
investment in our rent program and its effectiveness. I think that one thing we talk about often in um, in this board meeting is a way to assist both tenants and landlords. And this sounds like a good way to do that. I know I'm sure it's frustrating, for instance, for landlords to have to like bring in legal, you have to pay for a lawyer, for instance, and have it escalate to a point that's emotionally draining and hard for tenants and landlords. And it sounds like if this is a way for everyone on staff to have more skills to not help it reach that point where both parties are having to expend money and stress. I mean, that sounds like a good investment. It also sounds like a good way. It sounds like some professional development as well, which I think would help with staff retention. And I know that we're probably hoping to not have more turnover. So this sounds like a good investment to me. Um, I know that we've done mailings before, but you know, I, I think that the more skills we have, you know, allotted to all of our staff, that sounds that sounds like a good idea. So I I'm advocating for just a full expenditure on option one. Very good. Anybody else uh, want to make a comment? I'll make a quick comment. Then is as I was reviewing the options, I think one of the most important uh, uh, functions of a body like ours is to invest in training for our staff members. And to me, anyone who walks in the door has just walked into mediation. And mediation, which is, whether it's full fledged or whether it's just getting people to understand the the the, the toing and the froing of the issue, um, assists in a better outcome for both the landlord and the tenant. And also when you make an investment in uh, a staff member, that staff member uh, feels more confident, more appreciated and uh, gives us a better end product when dealing with our clients. So that would also be my inclination. Um, now, uh, did we have uh, members of the, um, uh, the audience that wish to comment on this. Did we have any speakers? Yes, we have one speaker. All right. Would you call the speaker, please? I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh. I, I just had one more quick comment. Um, that uh, the reason why I think the mailings are important because we have new landlords and tenants coming to Richmond all the time, and they need to be informed. So, <laughs> okay. I, I I can also add that um, you know right now we're the the. Option number one includes uh, training for six staff. We could do um, four staff and uh, 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 remove uh, the staff attorney and our hearing examiner from the training since both of them um, have had some experience in the past doing mediations in court or through the hearing process. Uh, but having our housing counselors and um, Fred, our deputy director who supervises the whole unit um, uh, is, uh, I think is important. So that would cost around 6,700 uh, mm -hmm. for four staff, which would really, uh, what's the, which would, you know, give us uh, another $3,300 to spend on, um, on outreach. And $3,300 would likely, um, allow us to reach all of the tenants who are rent controlled, um, uh, or all tenancies that are rent controlled and Richmond landlords. Uh, but that, but it wouldn't be able to, to reach all tenants and all landlords. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Trailer. And Ms. Connor, I want to, excuse me. Um, Mr. Vasilis has his hand up. I, I will get to Mr. Vasilis in a moment. I see that. Thank you. I want to apologize to uh, board member Johnson. I did not see your hand up, which is why I kind of seem to gloss over you. My apology for that. Mr. Vasilis. Yeah, I, for some reason, I thought when we, we originally went over the grant a couple of meetings ago that it was the theme of it was rent assistance. And is there no, is where, where is that standing? Because I, I see in the presentation, we talk about, you know, the ongoing uh, meetings uh, in regards to a rent assistance program. And is that where this grant came from originally? And it was just to be a, just a general grant for whatever, or was it supposed to be like targeted towards some sort of future, uh, 
you know, development in terms of creating a rental assistance program that's permanent? Uh, no, there are no restrictions on other than lobbying and, and for using the, the monies. Um, I thought it was appropriate to um, have some nexus with rent assistance and eviction since um, um, rent assistance is about uh, preventing, you know, displacement and, and uh, evictions. Uh, so one of the reasons I, I advocate for uh, mediation training is uh, in the process of um, mediating uh, eviction related disputes, um, you start out with uh, a discussion oftentimes about rent assistance. You of, often discuss uh, repayment plans discuss other, other issues around um, uh, rental debt. So I do think there is a nexus with rent assistance when it comes to mediation. Um, the, uh, the other, the, the mass outreach campaign would also allow us to, uh, to reach the Richmond tenants and landlords to make sure they were aware that the uh, city of Richmond um, has money still, um, has hundreds of thousands of dollars in ARPA funds and other funds uh, to disperse uh, to tenants. Uh, so we, you know, that, that would be obviously very related to, to, to getting rent assistance in people's hands. Uh, but I, 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 I do think that a long-term investment in staff um, is important in terms of uh, helping them uh, uh, gain the skills necessary uh, to resolve eviction-related disputes. Um, and many of these eviction-related disputes um, require uh, the investigation into whether or not rent assistance can be a, a way to um, uh, alleviate the situation. Now, is there anyone else of the, from the board that wishes to speak on this item? All right, in that case, um, uh, Cynthia, would you be good enough to call the uh, audience member? Sure, let me share my screen. The speaker is Ms. Alana Clark. Let me share my screen for the clock. It's Alana Clark. Can you hear me? Yes. Can okay. So of the three options, I think uh, outreach, that's something that's ongoing that you got to do anyway, and you've been doing it. So I'm not sure why you want to put this money towards outreach since redundant. General fund, if you want to put it in your general fund, you've got to lower the fees by a equal amount. Um, you're not for profit, so you can't take in more than you use. Um, mediation, however, um, my vote is for mediation. I think it's pretty pathetic that you guys are doing so little mediation. And according to your literature, you only have one person trained for mediation. You have seeds right next door in Berkeley, ready and willing to train. Um, and honestly, your cases should be going to mediation as a default. The lawyers should be a, a second or last resort. So really beef up your mediation programs because that's, that's really what's gonna help this community. And that's one of the few things in my opinion, this rent program actually has to offer. So go for it. Now that you have a chance, go for it. Beef up your mediation and keep it going, make it robust. Right now it is anything but robust. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was the only speaker. All righty. Now at this point, uh, unless, oh, Mr. Tran, do I see a hand? I see something there. It's very mysterious. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Tran, it looked like a hand to me. Okay. Uh, in that case, um, are there any questions or statements by any more of the board members before we uh, entertain a motion? May I have a motion, please?
I would move that the board authorized spending part of the funds for training, um, doing mediation training for the four staff members identified by the director and <clears throat> leaving the remaining $3,500 in the general fund for some future purpose of related to um, the rental assistance or professional development of staff. Is there a second for that motion? Hearing none, we will entertain a, a, a new motion. So I move that we authorize um, partial funding for option one and a partial funding for option two, 5,000 a piece. And just, just to be clear, Number one, of course, is the uh, mediation training and option number two is an outreach campaign. Is that correct? Yes, yeah, specifically uh, mass mailings. Okay. May we have a second on that motion? Hearing none, may we have a new motion? All right, third time's the charm. I move that we approve option one in full. So all of the funding goes to mediation training for the six employees as discussed. All right, uh, may I have a second? In that case, I will, I will pr uh, provide the second. May we have a vote please? Okay. Board Member Connor? Yes. Board Member Johnson? Yes. Board Member Vasilas? Yes. Vice Chair Mishek? Yes. And Chair Finley? Yes. Motion passes. Motion passes to approve for option one. In full. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is item G3. Item G3 is to receive training on the Brown Act and Rosenberg's Rules of Order. There is one speaker on this item. Okay, uh, thank you. Members of the rent board and Chair Finley, Charles Oshinuga, I'll be presenting on this item. Um, many of you have had this exact training. Oh, sorry, the PowerPoint's not up. Why don't we wait until the PowerPoint gets up? Uh, Fred, can you share your screen with the PowerPoint? It's in the PowerPoint folder. It's actually, Fred, it's going to be in the in the actual item folder. So you I'll have move to it. Oh. Well, I, I, I've edited it since. Oh, you just did? Yeah. So. Okay, we'll get that one then. I'm sorry. We moved this so it could be in one place. No worries. So yeah, Fred, it's under G3. And then you can just click it right there. Thank you. Are you able to see the screen? Yes. Although there is a bit of it, Charles, that is is cut off, but I don't know whether it will affect the the uh, the print. It's too soon to tell. Okay, let me know. Okay, it's cut off. But okay, so let's let's just start again. Again, is. Uh, 
Charles Oshinuga, General Counsel. I'll be presenting on item G3. It's a training on the Brown Act and Rosenberg Rules of Order. Um, many of you have already received this training. Not many of you, in fact, all of you have, in fact, received this training at least once. Some of you, I think, four times, and some of you three to two to three times. So I, I'm going to treat this as a as a refresher. I'm going to try to go through it as efficiently as possible. It's 28 slides. I'm going to do my best to to truncate where I can um, because a lot of it's going to be redundant. Next slide. All right, so we'll start just with a just with the um, overview. It's gonna I'm gonna speak about meetings first, um, noticing requirements, public comment, and then closed session. Next slide. All right, as you may remember, the Brown Act was passed during the Nixon era, where I think the political corruption was at its height in terms of backdoor dealings. So at that time, uh, Nixon was uh, being impeached, and every state in the United States decided to pass more stringent regulation or stringent laws around regulating public meetings. They, their aim, their goal was to get rid of all these backdoor dealings to force any kind of meeting to be made in public so that the public can be involved and, and uh, scrutinize what was happening. And so out of that background came what we know in California as the Brown Act. And um, the Brown Act applies to all legislative bodies and it requires that all, the, all meetings should be open in public uh, except for a few exceptions. Next slide. So again, the Brown Act is aimed at regulating meetings, and it's important then to know what a meeting is. And a meeting is whenever a majority of the members of a legislative body come together at the same time or place to hear, discuss, or deliberate on an item within its jurisdiction. For our purposes, a legislative body does include the rent board. It can also include task force, uh, commissions, obviously council, um, et cetera. Next slide. So um, I'm gonna sp speak about this more in, in the next slide, but meetings can also include direct communications, use of technology and serial meetings. But again, whenever we meet, whenever there is a meeting, there has to be certain rules that are followed that you are all familiar with, such as agendizing items and making sure the public has access to those meetings. So we wanna really understand when a meeting occurs. Next slide. So meetings can, they obviously occur like this meeting when they're public, uh, when they've been agendized and when there are a call to session, right? And that's what we traditionally think of, of, of as a meeting, but there are all sorts of meetings that, that, that can occur. There are meetings that happen before, that, that can happen before a regularly scheduled meeting or that can possibly happen after our meeting. Um, and when these meetings happen, they too need to be agendized. Some of them are not as obvious. For instance, if, you, if three board members uh, just randomly go out to eat dinner uh, with their families and they all bump into each other at a restaurant well there's a majority of board members present right? <laughs> and so the first prong is is satisfied and then the second prong we need to explore which is uh did the board are the board members there to discuss here or deliberate on any item or issue that falls within their jurisdiction obviously if you go to a restaurant just to eat dinner with your family you know the purpose of your visit at the restaurant was not to discuss the item so initially it's not a meeting however if you all three get together, you see each other at the restaurant, you get together and you start talking about the board, any item that falls in front of the board or that may fall in front of the board, that would be a meeting. And that discussion there is then prohibited and it violates the Brown Act. And we can talk about the consequences therein, but that, that kind of uh, instance circumstance would be a meeting. It's not obvious in the beginning, but it becomes obvious towards the end. Um, additionally, you know, if you're on a group chat, maybe you guys are a bunch of buddies, on this uh, rent board and you're on a group chat with each other well there's three people if there's a majority of you on a group chat if you talk that 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 satisfies the first prong now if you speak about or listen to or deliberate on any item that comes before the rent board or that may come before the rent board that group chat would be a meeting and because it's not publicly noticed that's also a violation of of the brown act so my uh, i i always strongly encourage every government official you know, just don't uh, don't group chat with your fellow commissioners or rent board members. Uh, don't when you email, don't reply all. Or don't have don't do chain emails. If you really are buddies and friends, you can get together, but just don't talk about work. 
you know, it's my general rule of thumb. You're all pretty interesting people. I'm sure you have a lot more to talk about than items before the rent board. All right, so let's, so that, those are the kind of meetings that can occur, you know, before um, the regular scheduled meeting or after the regular scheduled meeting. One last thing I think that's important is you know, when we're in person, you'll see this oftentimes, uh, council members or board members, they arrive a few minutes before the meeting is, is called to session. So th there's obviously a majority of board members there. We just have to be very extremely, in fact, careful that we're not speaking about anything that deals with our subject matter jurisdiction until the uh, meeting is called to session. Because if you do, even if it, it's one minute before the meeting is called, it still violates the Brown Act. The meeting has to be called before we can actually have a meeting. Um, and same thing after the meeting, you know, when we're all trying to file out of the chambers, we're trying to speak with each other. Let's just make sure we're not speaking about anything that falls within our subject matter jurisdiction. Next slide. So, you know, when the law was passed, people being as clever as people are said to themselves, well, a meeting is a majority of a legislative body and, you know, meeting at the same time and place to discuss here or deliberate on issues that come before us. Well, what if we weren't meeting at the same time or the same place? So some clever people get together and they say, okay, we're going to do something called sequential meetings uh, where you know, board member A, let's just hypothetically board member A wants to wants to speak to board member B about rent increases, right? So they either call them up or meet them or speak to them on the phone, text them, however they communicate. And then board member B, after that conversation happens with board member A, board member B then talk, speaks with board member C. Well, that's three board members right there speaking about the same issue. And that issue falls within the subject matter jurisdiction of, of the rent board despite the fact that the board members never actually together met in person at the same time and place, it still constitutes a meeting. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a loophole that was closed by the legislators to make sure that you can't talk about pretty much government business uh, with the majority of people, with the majority of rent board members or legislative members um, without it first being publicly noticed and without the meeting being called to session. So avoid that. If you're speaking with a board member about anything that might fall within the board's jurisdiction, that's already two people who have spoken about the same item. Don't speak to a third person about that same item. All right. Um, same thing with the hub and spoke example. Uh, you can think of a bicycle and you have the hub in the middle and the spokes come off the hub. Well, the hub is the facilitator of the conversation. So let's just imagine board member A speaks to board member B about rent increases. And then after speaking to board member B, board member A calls board member C and speaks to board member C about the same issue. That's a violation, despite the fact that board member B and C never spoke to each other. It's still a violation because we have, we have three people having knowledge, having spoken indirectly on the same issues. Um, so again, please avoid that scenario. Uh, this does not this does not include, for the most part, staff. You can always talk to staff about issues, especially the attorney like myself. You can all speak to me about about a legal issue. However, staff cannot contact you if staff has a policy issue in mind. Let's say staff wants to propose rent decreases or whatever example you want to give. Oh, a, a, a change in the owner moving regulations. S staff. Can't not, they, staff cannot reach out to board member A and speak to board member A about that, board member B, speak to them about that, and board member C. Once they've spoken to the third, uh, to the third board member on the same issues, that's a meeting. And because that's not agendized, that's a violation of the Brown Act. So staff always gets the training from me, so they know not to do that, but just for the edification of the board members and the public, that's the rule. <clears throat> and like I've said before, uh, be careful of the reply all email. Next slide. Now, I'm not going to spend too much time on this because you all already know this, but essentially when you do have a meeting, you have to agendize that meeting and you do that by posting an agenda um, 72 hours prior to the meeting. Um, and that's for regular meetings. If it's a special meeting, it's 24 hours. For the rent board here, we, we, we typically give way more than 72 hours um, for both regular meetings and special meetings, but just be aware that's the rule. And the agenda has to be posted in an area that's freely accessible to members of the public. Next slide. 
Now, the agenda is very important, as you all already know. Each agenda must have a meaningful description of each item of business, whether the item is on for discussion or for action. And um, there is the definition right there in terms of meaningful description. I'm not going to read it. I will just say that the agenda language has to be clear. It has to be clear um, such that a, a person can read it and understand you know, what's going to be discussed so they can be prepared and informed and come and participate in a meaningful way at our meetings. Uh, we typically have more language, I think, in our agenda than is necessary to satisfy this. It's actually a very low bar, low bar but I think at the rent board, at the rent program, we like to be uh, extra careful and extra sure that the language is sufficient. Next slide. Um, and we all know this, um, every agenda for a regular meeting must allow members of the public to speak on any item of interest, and that's what we do. We do that through our open forum. We also um, allow people to speak on individual items. You can regulate that as we, as we have, such that you can say you have to submit a request to speak on the item prior to the item being called. Um, if the item is called and they have not re submitted their request to speak, then they have forfeited that right to speak on that item. Um, however, as you've seen in this meeting and other meetings, the chair can ex exercise their discretion and allow the speaker to speak. Typically, you'll see uh, speakers losing their right to speak if it's a, at a larger meeting with way more attendance. You see that at the city council meeting often. Some people just, if you don't put it on the card or call in before the, the scheduled timeline, there is no exception. You just lose that right. Uh, next slide. And why does it matter what's listed on the agenda? I think we all know, but just to refresh our recollection, uh, a legislative body cannot discuss or act on items not on an agenda. And that's why the agenda language is very important. It needs to be broad enough to, uh, to allow for a discussion, uh, a robust discussion. It doesn't have to be detailed enough where you're pointing out every single thing you're gonna speak about, but broad enough to allow uh, a reasonable person to understand that th these topics may come up during the discussion. Uh, next slide. There are very limited exceptions to uh, being able to speak on something that's not on the agenda. For instance, uh, you're permitted to make a brief public announcement in cases of, uh, of uh, safety or, or an emergency. Um, you can't. It's permissible for a board member to respond to statements made um, or questions posed by members of the public. Uh, they can do that by either asking the member who made the statement to, for clarification, or they, they can refer the member to speak to staff, or they can even request staff to come back to a subsequent, at a subsequent meeting to discuss what, what, the, uh, what the member of the public had brought up. I think for instance, I think there was a member of the public who talked about um, the, the moratorium and, and losing, losing their job. And it would be pro it would be appropriate for any staff member, any board member, to have told that member of the public that um, the rent board does not control the moratorium. The rent board did not pass the moratorium. The rent board was never consulted on the moratorium. The moratorium is a creature of the city council, and that they would the, the speaker would probably get better traction bringing their comments to the city council. And the city council is actually meeting next Tuesday. You see, now all that was okay. Um, so long as that doesn't turn into further discussion that goes back and forth. I think there was also a member that spoke about uh, the 3%. I think there's legislation about 3%. And again, that legislation is was put on by the, uh, the voters. Uh, they, they got enough signatures, but the city council is the one that voted to put that before the voters. And that, that legislation was never considered by the board. They never, they, the drafters never consulted the board on that and the board never weighed in on that. So we don't have any control over it. It's going to the voters. If you have any comments or questions, it, you might get more traction uh, going before the city council. All right, um, next slide. So there are exceptions to the, to the public meeting. You can have closed session meetings. Um, in the government code, there is a delineation of the circumstances where closed sessions are appropriate. I did not include it here because I don't think it's very germane to this discussion, uh, but you should know that it, it exists. And you should also know that whenever we do go into closed sessions, uh, which, is, which has been a very few amount of times, whenever we do go into closed session, you'll see that I, I would 
create a, my agenda language will cite to the specific um, statute that authorizes the basis of the closed session, and that is required. And the public has the right to look that statute up, of course, and ensure that um, we have laid the foundations to, to get into closed session. And you'll see that the city council does that as well on all of their agendas. Uh, next slide. There are consequences for violating the Brown Act. There's criminal penalties and there's civil penalties. The criminal penalties is a misdemeanor. Um, uh, I, I have never seen it in all my practice. I've never seen the DA charge criminally for a Brown Act violation. I will say it does happen. I've read cases that where it has happened, but the factual circumstances that justify the criminal charge was pretty egregious. I mean, as written here on the slide, you have to really intentionally undertake an action to deprive the public of information, you know, it seems a bit outrageous some of these facts so that that seems to be less common what's more common are the civil remedies and civil penalties. If you violate the Brown Act, um, you can be sued, you, you the individual board members can be liable for attorneys fees and any action taken about taken by the violators um, is rendered void. So if you relied on any of those actions taken, they, it would undo whatever act that was taken at the board meetings. Uh, next slide. I have a public records thing here. It's, it's, it's a little bit tangential, but it's important just to know that these meetings are conducted in public and the information you submit to the board or to the program, that's a those are public documents and that's, those are subject to the, to the Public Records Act. I always say this, um, it seems like I don't get much traction, but I'll say it again, for anyone submitting documents to the rent board, uh, you, please don't include your social security number or your driver's license number. I've seen things like that. There's no reason for you to include that. If you're confused as to what to submit, you can simply just reach out to the rent board or the rent program and talk to a staff member. Um, we don't need your, there's no reason we need your social security number. And the problem there is if you submit the document to our office or to the board, that document becomes a public record. It's no longer your document. It's not our document, it's the public's document. And so it's subject to disclosure, disclosure except for certain exceptions or exemptions um, that we do adhere to. And we, we do redact out the information if it's, if it's requested, um, but we're all, uh, fallible. We can all make mistakes and you don't want your really intimate details out there. So please contact us if you have any questions. Next slide. You can skip this one. It's redundant. Next slide. Uh, finally, there's going to be a training in November next month or December on conflicts of interest. There, it's going to speak about the prohibition of having a financial interest in a contract made by the board and a prohibition on participating in decisions or influencing a decision when you have a disqualifying financial interest. And the conflict of interest laws are codified in the Political Reform Act for anyone interested, and they're maintained by the FPPC, which stands for the Fair Political Practices Commission, I think. Um, and they, they, um, they write regulations around the um, conflict of interest laws, and there's tons of regulations around it. So it's a very extensive web of, of legislation and regulations. The training that I'm going to give is going to be a very broad overview. It should be fairly short, uh, but that's going to be in November or December. Next slide. So I just want to quickly move on to the Rosenberg's Rules of Order. I usually train on the Brown Act and on the rules at the same time, but you are all so familiar with it that I think I can kind of breeze through it. You've done it so many times. Uh, but the purpose, next slide, the, the purpose of the, of the rules of orders is just to help you um, help establish order, of course, and promote clarity. But the, the practical purpose is just to help you all no longer feel, over, uh, feel overwhelmed by the complexities of the procedures that happen at a rent board meeting or any rent board meeting. Um, hopefully, they enable you to use the rules freely to navigate your way through the meeting and feel comfortable uh, presiding over the meeting if if that's one of your duties. One last thing you should know is many of you will probably serve on different boards, committees, commissions. Um, many of you probably are already doing that. And these rules are very translatable. I think in the state of California, these are the predominantly used rules. There are a different set of rules called the Roberts Rules of Orders, a little bit more technical, but these rules are foundational. And so even if it's a different set of rules, a lot of it will be um, overlapping with these rules. So 
it's always a good thing to get familiar with these rules. These rules are also in our regulations, regulations 313, if you're interested. Uh, okay, next slide. Uh, so real briefly, the role of the chair, if any of you later become chair, we have a chair who already knows the role of the chair, but just so you all know, it's, you must get, you, obviously you have to understand the rules. You move the meeting and the agenda, you take the lead role in the process and you take a less active role in the, in the debate meaning you usually facilitate the debate and your comments are typically reserved towards the end. Your main job is to create the contours in which the meeting happens. So if any member is kind of going out of the, the, the scope of the meeting, you kind of rein them back in. Sometimes I'll do that if it's very obvious, you know, you're obviously in, going in a different direction, but typically I will not do that. Uh, next slide. And this is just the order of the agenda. I'm not going to go over it, but we do have an order of an agenda. It's in our regulations, and this is why our agenda appears the way it appears. Next slide. Uh, voting, you all know, but just as a reminder, so typically under the Rosenberg Rules of Order, you need a simple majority to pass an item. Um, uh, sometimes you need a, a super majority, but most of the times you need a simple majority. Under the rent ordinance, we don't do simple majority or super majority. We just do three members. You need three members. And so sometimes, yes, that's gonna be a simple majority. Sometimes that's gonna require that it be unanimous. For instance, if we have a quorum at three and only three mem board members are able to attend a meeting, you need all three of those board members to agree on any item for the item to be passed. Next slide. Just, um, I think you skipped one, Fred. Yeah, uh, just real quick, uh, how do you count abstain votes? Rarely do we see a board member abstain, but when they do abstain, we just don't count that vote, right? We only count it for the purposes of quorum. But an abstain, a vote in abstentia is neither a yes nor a no. Next slide. All right, we have three kinds of motions that you are all familiar with, because I've seen you all make these kinds of motions. Uh, the first motion is a basic motion, and that puts forth a decision for the board to consider. And that's exactly like what happened at the last uh, item. You know, I moved that we adopt a 10K user grant in this particular way, right? That's a basic motion. Now you've moved, you made a motion and uh, you put forth a decision for the board to consider. There is a motion to amend. Um, this is often not used. What's typically used is a friendly, a request for a friendly amendment. Um, but a motion to amend is an actual motion. And if it receives a second, it must be voted on. So let's say I vote to, I move to uh, that the grant be used for the billboard. Um, if someone said, you know, someone just doesn't want that motion to be on the ground, or maybe they want it to be split, they can say, I, I move, you know, before my motion is seconded, they can motion and they can move to amend the motion on the floor. And their motion can be, I, I want to amend Charles's motion that we split the grant to be used for both the billboards and outreach. And if that motion, if that amendment gets a second, if you second that amendment, then we vote on it. And if there's a vote in the affirmative, then the motion on the ground now is that amended motion. You know, and, and if that if that new amended motion gets a second, in, then we vote on it. Um, and as I mentioned, there's also the friendly amendment uh, request. It's not a motion, just a request. If I, if I move that we use the um, fees or the grant for billboard purposes, someone can say, hey, Charles, are you open to a friendly amendment to amend your motion to include the spending of the grant on um, uh, outreach? You know, and I can obviously I can accept that motion that 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 friendly amendment request, and that becomes now part of my motion, or I can reject it, and my motion stands as is. Um, finally, there's a substitute motion. A substitute motion does away with the basic motion and puts forth a new motion. A substitute motion must be voted on first, and if it fails, then the original motion is next. So, for instance, if I move that we spend the grant on billboards. And uh, any board member can, before my motion is seconded, any board member can move, can make a substitute motion. They can say, I want to make a substitute motion that the grant money be spent on advertise, um, on um, outreach or mediation, sorry, on mediation. And if, so that substitute motion is now the motion on the floor. And if that motion gets a second, we vote on that motion first. If that motion passes, then the item's over. If that motion fails, we come back to my original motion which is to use the grant money on billboards. 
and I, I, I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with that, but I just wanted to go over that real quick. Next slide. Uh, some motions require debates. Most motions require debates, like the motion I just made, basic motions, substitute motions, motions to amend. Some motions don't require debates, like a motion to adjourn. And you can make these motions at any time. If we're in an item and it's taken a very long time and you're getting tired, uh, you know, any board member can say, I move to adjourn this meeting. Like you just want to, you just want to be done with it. Before the motions even, before the items even concluded, you can make that motion. And they, there could be no discussion on that motion. Uh, the chair has to request a second. If the motion is seconded, you have to immediately take a vote. And if you're, if, if it passes, the, the meeting's over without the item having been completed. So some motions, there is no debate. All right. And those are the motions listed for you right there. Uh, no, that's okay. It's for a next slide. It's fine. Uh, some motions require a supermajority. We're not going to get into this because, like I said, um, there is the three vote exception under the, the uh, Richmond Rent Ordinance. We don't do supermajorities and we don't do super majorities. We just do three rent board members. But if you serve on a different board or commission or legislative body, just be aware if you're using the Rosenberg Rules of Order, it's, it's not going to be such a solid number, a bright line rule like three, it will be a simple majority or a super majority requirement. And these motions require super majorities. Uh, next slide. Now, finally, there's a motion to reconsider. It's a special kind of motion. Um, what it does is it reconsiders an item that you've already passed and it must be made during the same meeting and it can only be made by members who voted in the majority. So you've, you've passed a, uh, You've already passed the, the last item you passed to use the the grant for uh, mediation. Now, if one of those board members who voted to in the affirmative thinks that they made a mistake, or there's some factual um, considerations that weren't accurately put forth, or whatever the reason, they can at any time before the meeting is over, they can move to. I usually say you should do it before the next item is called, or before items are called, not during items. But they can move to reconsider um, the past the past um, approved item, and if that is seconded, we do take a vote. And if it's passed, what it does is it undoes it undoes what was what you've done before on that on the um, grant item, and that grant item is is restored to its original state as if it never been voted on, and it's pushed to the end of the calendar, and it's reconsidered at the end of the calendar. You can take a new, you can discuss it more, you can take a new vote, et cetera, et cetera. Um, finally, next slide. This is the last slide. Um, it's just, you all don't have an issue this, with this. I usually put it at the last slide, uh, just you know, remind the public typically about the courtesy and decorum, you know, and the rent board does a really good job about respecting each other and being okay with disagreements. So I'm not gonna preach to you. I know you all know that you're all responsible and respectful human beings. So I will just leave that slide up and that is all for my training. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Oshinuga. Uh, are there any questions uh, on the item? Uh, Mr. Vasilis. Yeah, I just have a quick question. Um, so I know staff can't talk to the majority of the, the board. Um, are there, do, do these rules apply to staff's interaction with like the, the city council? Um, okay, so first staff, staff can talk to the majority of the board. We're not a... Um... Well, I mean, they, they can't just choose three members yes. to only interact with, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and you're asking, does it apply to city count? What do you, and what? Can you so me like, so it, uh, does the Brown Act or any regulation apply to, let's say if, uh, staff wanted to talk to four members of the city council about something because the city council, you know, we're, we're independent, but the city council can make decisions. Can staff members talk to uh, city council in such a manner? Rent program staff? Specifically? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. It's a good question. I, you know, I, I think just, just considering it, I think it would be okay. Um, if you have one, staff members speaking on maybe maybe city council members reach out and they want to understand i don't know whatever their proposals might be better i think that's absolutely fine typically staff generally even even uh, city staff are they they are not considered a legislative body you know right. what would be what would be problematic probably is if 
if you're you're just acting as an as a middle person so I, i'm just talking to one city council member with the purpose of conveying to the next city council member where the prior city council member stands in terms of their vote right and I'm, and that would that would that that would bring you up to the line you probably should avoid that but if i'm just providing general information this is how this ordinance works and et cetera, et cetera, that should be okay okay thanks yeah any other questions uh, Cindy, I see that we have one speaker. Would you like to call the speaker? Yes, I can. Thank you. So I guess that's me. Yes, Cordell Hemmer, go ahead. That's me. So uh, good evening, uh, Chair Finley, uh, board members. Um, my name is Cordell Hemmer and I'm a Richmond resident. So thank you, uh, Charles, for that uh, present, uh, that training. So. Uh, let me see if I can put my little spin on it. So when I was on the library commission, I had to make sure that I, I had to get trained too on about Robert's rule, Rosenberg, Rosenberg's rules of order and how the Brown Act implies to me. So when I was looking at the slide and I said, okay, there would be, uh, there would be, you know, like uh, ad hoc committee. So, so at the time when I was on the commission, the chair um, directed myself and another commissioner, you know, to sit down and figure out who would be the chair for our group. So, uh, so me and the commissioner, we would like, you know, talk about what qualities do we want to see in the next chair. And I said, so I wrote down some qualities, and I said, okay, this person would be a good choice to be chair because of the following reasons. And and then the second thing is um, posting the agenda. It's it's very simple because I've seen city staff, you know, post the agendas not only for city council but for other boards and commissions. And I said, okay, it sounds logical, you know, like to post the agenda within a certain amount of time. So I said that's perfect. And then I'll just leave it at that because I just like the pre uh, it's, the presentation is pretty much self-explanatory. So that's it. He was the only speaker. At the very last, I couldn't heard. Was there a question in there somewhere for, for Mr. Oshinuga? Or was it simply a statement? I'm sorry. I... I'm sorry. That was me announcing that he was the only and last speaker. Oh, OK. All right. Then clearly, there it was not a question. Um, in in that case, uh, Mr. Oshinuga, we don't have to do anything at this point, do we? We received the training. That's correct. All right, we thank you for that. Thank you very much. Uh, in that case, um, my goodness. The next Why don't we go on to two officers? Yes, thank you. Um, the next item is item H. Um, under reports of officers. Uh, Chair Finley and members of the Rent Board, <clears throat> um, you may recall that in uh, July um, we held a workshop on how to increase rents in Richmond. Uh, this month on October 28th, we have been. I'm sorry, I, it's hard to hear again. Vic, you faded out. You <clears throat> might want to put your, ear, put your earphones back on. That was better. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Johnson. All right. Yeah, that's better. Let's see. Yeah, I think when you put those on. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. No, that's better. Perfect. All right. So as I mentioned, uh, in July, on July 29th of this uh, year, we held a workshop, a webinar on how to increase rents in Richmond. Um, this month on October 28th, so next week, uh, we will be doing a a webinar on how to file a rent decrease petition. So uh, that just wanted to inform the board and the public about that. Um, and that is it. Report of officers. Okay. And that's it. That's the last item on the agenda. Then in that case, I thank you all very, very much. 
And this meeting is adjourned at uh, 10 minutes to seven or 6.15, whichever you prefer. I was going to move oh. to adjourn just to be funny, but I thought. Miss <laughs> <laughs> oh, Connor, oh. if you are so moved, please do move. <laughs> be adjourning on a lot of items now that she's a veteran. <laughs> That's going to be her thing. I, well, okay. I, I, I think we're ignoring the, we don't have a second on that one. So we'll just go ahead and consider it done. <laughs> Thank you so very much, everyone. Have a nice evening. Have a nice Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.